foster the trust of your readership, uh, whether it be with this book or with um, with your day-to-day -day reporting. Uh, yeah, you were asking me like which who I which journalists I admire, and there are so many. But um, uh, Martin Gelman at the Washington Post wrote a book uh, that I read years ago called Angler by Dick Cheney. And I remember going like, once. I was, it was a really incredible book, and like so well researched, and I was blown away by it. But then I got to the end of the book and turned the last page and saw that his notes section, like the attributions for everything, was like this thick or whatever. And he had cited every single fact in that book. It's not that there was, you know, footnotes, numbers all, all throughout it, but. You could go back and look at a sentence that he said, as a declarative sentence, and go to the end and say, this is based on interviews with three senior officials in this department on this day that took place, or, and I was just so blown away by that. Um, and it just, it, it made me feel so um, comfortable in his work that I, I completely believed it. And I remembered that throughout my career. And in Crazy Town, I, I, I tried to do that, um, every single fact. I tried to cite at the end and explain where I got this information. And that just, yeah, in that terms of that trust, um, the public does not trust the media. We know this um, in Canada and the States. There's eroding trust in all public institutions, but yeah, people do not believe journalists. And I think that that's something that we have to be just really vigilant about. And I think a lot of it comes from the fact that people don't realize how hard journalists try to be fair and accurate. Um, the lengths that we go, for instance, I was saying, I was supposed to have a big story in the paper today, but um, we decided to hold it a day because the people that we sent detailed questions to um, asked for more time to respond, and they already had quite a while to respond, and we made the decision, okay, we will hold off. <laughs> you know, it's like late in the day, we will hold off and publish the next day so that they have an adequate amount of time to respond. Um, just these little things. So, it, and it's sitting here and having these types of conversations and explaining um, how we go about doing our jobs that I hope people have a, have a more a bigger understanding. Because during the four stuff, when the crack video broke and everyone thought we were making that up, it was like for those of us in the media, it's kind of astonishing. It's like, how can people think that a major newspaper would make up that story? Like, we, like for one, how would we not get sued? How would we? Uh, like, we all like, sat here around the table and just decided to, I don't know, why don't we pretend that we've seen a video of the mayor smoking crack and then we're going to tell Gawker and then Gawker's going to publish it and then we're going to say yes. It's, it's like, it was just kind of mind-boggling, but that was, that's a, that's thing that happened and it was kind of a wake-up call for me. So going back to your public writing experience, you know, room full of students and academics who most of which are probably writing a paper right now. <laughs> Can you talk about your experience of actually putting pen to paper with Crazy Town and what you went through with that and what you learned about that actual writing experience? Um, I said earlier that I uh, wanted to be an actress and that I decided, you know, journalism might be fun because I like writing. Um, I hate writing, actually, it turns out. <laughs> I, it's my absolute least favorite part of my job. Um, I really love reporting. <laughs> Um, so yeah, when it gets time for me to actually sit down and have to write, it's like I always normally need a copy, just need to like read my notes once more, um, and that, that's kind of the yeah something that I always struggle with. When it came time to write a book, I don't know if any of you written a book or tried to write a book, but it take a long time, and um, most journalists I know who've written books, it's been like. A year. I had some of them like two years to turn around a manuscript. I had 91 days to write Crazy Town because it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's a commercial exercise as much as it is a piece of journalism and the publisher needs to sell it and they take a long time to print and find and blah, blah, blah. So um, we had to get it out quickly. And okay, so I have 91 days and it was going to be 90,000 words. So I'm not super great at math, but I can figure out what I needed to do there. Um, I had a ton of research to do. Uh, a lot of it was based on my um, experiences as a reporter at the Star, but the first two thirds of the book is before I was covering this guy. Um, so I had to research all of that. I went to 
um, Florida to see his, his, his condo where he was first arrested for drunk driving. And so I, I tracked down the police officer who pulled him over in Florida when he was a young man, right before he was running for politics. And it's the state which has a much better access to information situation than we do. So he had brought forth file. I was like, oh yeah, I can bring up the, uh, the file from the archives for you. He was like, okay, well, I will be on a plane just hold there for a second. Um, but yeah, so all this to say, I had 91 days to write 90,000 words and do a whole bunch of research and go on a trip, like to the state. Anyway, so what it meant is all of my previous kind of like procrastinating techniques just worked in a slide this time. So I remember I got like, someone said at the stables because I was kind of procrastinating and got like these big calendars and like laid them out and like wrote out the schedule for the day. I was like, I was like one day off a week. And then I quickly realized like, no, there's no possible way to take any days off. So I would get up every morning at around seven and go to a coffee shop. Luckily one of my very good friends is a TV writer and she does freelance a lot. So we would meet there, the two of us. And I'd write until like two-ish one-ish, and then I would do research until four or five or six-ish, and then I would go home and have dinner, and then I would write until 10 o'clock at night, and then I would get up the next morning and do it all over again. And it was just every day, non-stop, like round one day. And it's not like you could, you could get away from it. You can't um, kind of put it off because you have that thousand-word deadline every single day. And um, if you're, you know, a thousand good words, so you're really writing like two or three thousand words. Um, but yeah, so I guess that is to say that if you are writing a paper and you hate your life, um, <laughs> it's perfect. Sometimes you just have to go like, no, I just need to get this done. I just need to bang this out and then send it off and deal with it later. There is no deal with it later. It's just out of your mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so earlier we were kind of chatting a little bit about House of Cards and pop culture stuff. And in the investigative journalist, Billy Barnes, thing, I'd like to know, as both a young and female professional, does that part of your identity help or hinder in your in your professional life? What sort of like you so two questions, sort of. Like one, my thoughts on Billy Barnes, and two, <laughs> being a total <laughs> Yeah. So um, I love House of Cards. The Zoe Barnes character was sort of like the bane of my existence for a while because people would come up to me, like especially during the forest stuff, and like, oh my God, like you're just like Zoe Barnes. And they were reading it as a compliment. And I was like, no, I am nothing like Zoe Barnes. Like if, if you guys think I've watched House of Cards. So Zoe Barnes is like a young brunette who like wears Converse sneakers to work and kind of sits cross-legged on desks. And I do do all of those things and do have brown hair. But yeah, you can't like sleep with politicians to get information. Um, you can't like just print whatever people tell you and hope that it's right. Um, yeah, so that was really, but that again, it's like that, that perception of, of the media and what, I mean, I, yeah, that always, people always say, you know, like, oh, you're a reporter, like, can't you just call and like lie about who you are and get information that way? Like, no, we have to always identify ourselves up front. A lot of these things that you see on, on TV of how journalists go about doing their jobs, like interviewing someone and reading a report upside down and taking a secret photo of it, or like writing through desks. And we can't do any of that stuff. And we wouldn't want to. That undermines our credibility. Um, so that's one thing. And like next thing, being um, a woman, I, I guess I always say, this, and I say this a lot to young journalists, um, we all have cards in our hand, and you got to play those cards. And sometimes being a young woman really hurts me. Um, and uh, yeah, like this is a patriarchal society in large part, and sometimes men don't always want to talk to me. It's easier now, I will say, but especially when I was younger, and I looked like 15, <laughs> um, in my early days as a reporter at the Star, they just didn't take me seriously or want to talk to me or say like little girl or you'll have like men hit on you that you're trying to interview and you're just like banging your head against your desk like what is wrong with the world. <laughs> on the other hand, um, in your early days as a reporter, what you have to do a lot of is awful, um, they're called pickups. It's like if someone dies, you have to go to their family and get an interview and ask for a photo. And that's what young reporters spend a lot of their years doing and it's awful. Um, and I was 
Yeah, I'm good at it. And partly, I'm sure, is because if I'm knocking on your door, I'm a less threatening sight than like a big tall dude. <coughs> so, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's give and take on that front. So, did you experience any unsettling situations or feel like you were at risk at any time when you were working on that Raw Floor Fun? Yeah, it's funny. Like I, I had some unsettling situations. I had um, you get lots of like threats and, and, and stuff all the time as, as a reporter, which is a female reporter. But during Rob Ford, um, they were heightened. And I remember one. I had two serious ones, but um, like one guy called me uh, and said, like, I know where you live, and uh, I'm going to come to your house and rape you and then kill you. And it was like, it was more specific than that, but um, the big thing that scared me was to hung up the phone after he said that. Because usually people, when they make threats to me, they want you to like talk back to them and have like, a fight. This person like established it was me on the phone and then said this and then hung up. So that was rather unsettling. And then I had another guy to me similar, and he was sending it uh, from an email address that was like his real email address. It wasn't like he was hiding his identity. Um, so yeah, like those situations were um, were unsettling for sure. Uh, I got some bear spray. My girlfriend's and I went down to like, the rail way tracks and like practice shooting bear spray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what was what was honestly like more uh, the thing I was thinking about so much at that time was like I cannot believe that Cole suggests half of this city thinks we're making up this story. And like that was what was really dominating my um, my conscious at the time. Like, because we think about the crack video, we actually um, at the start the crack video is one of all the attention. But there was a story that we wrote before that was actually the one that I'm most proud of about the fact that Mayor Rob Ford had shown up at this military ball and was kicked out because he was so inebriated or intoxicated or messed up on something. And in that story, we go through all the allegations that we've been compiling on him for the last you know, year or two about his problems with alcohol and that his staff wanted him to go to rehab. And that was like a bomb that went off in the city. And the people within the culture, of the city hall culture, knew that that was true, um, but the public did. And actually, a lot of people at City Hall, I should say, kind of didn't think it was true either. So in that period, it was just like, oh my god, like, how can people not believe this? It's written in the newspaper. Um, so when people say, like, oh, were you scared in the car with the drug dealers? I was like, no. I was like, we finally have proof that like, we can advance this. So, not that I actually have the video. I have proof. It was the second time around when I was in the car with the drug dealers with the video. I did get screenshots of it. <laughs> I got a do-over on that set. <laughs> so you obviously have some experience with the sheriff and the crime being obviously very embedded in municipal politics, um, the mayor. I know you've experienced some piano. Um, can you talk just a little bit about that? And what do you think? I mean, do you think that politics um, I, I mean, I've reported like here and there on kind of politics. I haven't been like a on the hill reporter, but I did spend two months um, profiling Stephen Harper's well, the Conservative Party of Canada's lawyer, I mean Arthur Hamilton, which was like, a really fun story to do. Um, talk about that in a minute. But yeah, I mean, are politicians scrutinized too much? No. Like, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that we should get into personal lives, yeah, I don't care about affairs, and anything like that, unless it's affecting your ability to do your job. But no, these are public servants. They're being paid with our money, and they are powerful people. They have um, access to um, information that we don't have. They are the ones who decide laws. Um, <coughs> yeah, that, so no, I don't think that at all. I, I think probably like when we talk about the election and what's to be concerned about, and this is kind of like a nerdy, I mean, you know, journalist cares about this, but my big issue with the federal government is, is just access is the changes that have um, occurred under, it's not just the Harper government, but um, under the Harper government uh, in terms of 
um, the muzzling of scientists and experts that work for the federal service. Um, that can no longer speak to reporters. We were told to go through communications for everything, and communications often doesn't say much. Um, the Prime Minister chooses um, who gets to ask questions and um, doesn't take a lot of questions. And this is something that we saw Rob Ford do very effectively. Rob Ford did not speak to the media, and he you know, would not send press releases to the Toronto Star. The Toronto Star was the, you know, the biggest circulation newspaper. Um, just didn't want to deal with it, and people liked him for it. Um, I think Harper has really masterfully figured out that um, he's really controlling the message, and um, that is such a big concern for this election. And it kind of gets back to scrutiny of of, um, of politicians. I don't know if any of you guys have ever filed an access to information request. Like it's just they <laughs> just redact everything. Uh, Canadians are just really complacent about how transparent our government should be, and it's kind of, a, I know, kind of a boring topic, but we need to get really angry about it. So no, more scrutiny. <laughs> so as a journalist, you've been having difficulty getting major politicians to engage with you on that level. Um, there's a lot of contention around whether there is just rampant apathy among the youth demographic, or whether the issue is maybe that major parties and major politicians aren't engaging with students and youth. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, people 18 to 34 are like, well below the national average in terms of whether people are likely to vote. <laughs> it's apathy, but it's also, yeah, it's like, what are the federal parties talking about? Um, they're talking about benefits to seniors and TFSA contributions. Um, you know, when you're 20 years old, you know, or 22 years old, you've got student debt that you have to deal with. You don't have the time for TFSA contributions. You're trying to pay rent. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't as a, I mean, I as a newspaper reporter, I'm obviously aware of what's happening, but I didn't feel like super connected to my government and what was happening there until I bought a condo. That was when I really started to kind of go like, where is this money going exactly? Um, and I imagine that the next step is if you have kids, and you're like, where are my children going to school? And thinking about those sorts of things. So that's, I think, at the end of the day, why people get more invested is that they're paying more attention. Um, and certainly the federal leaders know this. If people are less likely to vote, and the Harvard government has done like a super uh, successful job of this, is dividing demographics and groups of people and building a coalition to get across the finish line and, and win an election. So, you know, it's not a surprise that they're um, giving seniors lots of goodies and looking at Alberta um, and the West in general, because uh, that's where they see their, their coalition. So speaking of students, how do you feel about taking some audience questions? Sure. Yeah. So we're we'll going to get into um, students, but if anyone has any questions, there are two mics on either side, and if you could just line up and give your name and your program. No pressure. Don't be shy, guys. It's always sad and full of us. We'll start at that side since you beat everyone. Like this perfect storm of 
print and like the decline of advertising revenue and pressures on the business side. Because that's the, at the end of the day, like I work with the Globe and Mail, and the Globe and Mail is like a spectacular newspaper that is so committed to uh, journalism and the you know reporting the news. And our owners are so supportive of that. And you know maybe we're not as like <laughs> weighing in the money like some other businesses that they get the money to, but. Um, at the same time, we are a business, right? So we, we can't like do this for free, and it's like this with all media. And now Canada is very fortunate because they do have a lot of media owners that genuinely feel this way. They really care. They believe in journalism. They believe in um, the role of of, uh, of the media. Um, but there are these commercial. We have to, have to be realistic. You can see the Toronto Star. They are now switching. They're launching this tablet. If you've seen that, they're they're kind of going with the La Presse model. So there's this um, paper in Quebec. They have transitioned from a newspaper to a tablet because it's a lot cheaper to put out something digitally and tree the green trees. And, um, which is all to say that there there are those pressures, and in Canada we have a better time of it. But yes, we have to be very vigilant about that. And I don't know if I have an answer for how we prevent it other than we keep our standards high. So we continue to go with this. We're not going to report your personal life until it crosses into um, uh, a public interest perspective. And yeah, we just need to report on ourselves. That's probably something that social media is really good at, is calling media out. Um, Thank you very much. Hi, Robin. It's Bernie Kings. My question is, how much does the role of partisanship play in the media? Hmm. <coughs> I think conventional wisdom would say that the <coughs> National Post and Toronto Sun are more right, and the Toronto Star is more left, and the Globe is sort of center, maybe left, maybe right to pay in the day. Um, I had worked at the Toronto Sun when I was a student. I worked at the Star for many years in internship with the Post and now the Globe. I can say I've never had an editor like consciously come down and say like, we are being a little too easy on Stephen Harper here. Um, newspapers just aren't necessarily that organized. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that of all the journalists, the journalist journalists that I know, I'm not talking about columnists, because columnists have a perspective that's makes them interesting to read. Reporters um, just want to report the news and report it accurately. Now, how editorials go, or which which stories make the front page versus the inside. I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the real focus is always on on covering everything as, as fair and balanced as can be. Now, as journalists, we yeah we have our own views, like we are all pretty united in our front that we would like more access to politicians and government documents and maybe that's why some people call us left wing. I don't see it in my day to day job. I know that doesn't always sound believable, but it, that that is the situation. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Anna Chen, I'm fourth year of science and uh, actually did a class on the politics and media with Dr. Andrew Walker here. You should come answer these questions. So what I was wondering is, I know Global News is a private news organization, as opposed to the CBC, and the CBC is having a, a controversy right now in terms of whether we should sell it or whether we should keep it public. I was wondering what your opinions on that are. Do you think it would be a good thing to put it in private hands or to keep it in the public? It's so tricky to journalists, you're not supposed to have opinions on things. Um, no, like I believe in a national broadcaster. Uh, the CBC um, reports on parts of this country that, uh, especially like right now, um, when so many media organizations are going out of business and don't have the resources to cover, especially you know, more northern communities, more rural communities, um, I just thought of the forest standard. My little local paper is now merged with a neighboring community. It's just, just I mean, there's still a paper there, but yeah, like there's not someone who's writing in forest anymore covering this. 
Um, the CDC fulfills that rule. I mean, the CDC obviously needs, it, is in the midst of reshuffling and is aware of that. Um, but no, I think we should absolutely invest in the national broadcaster. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Dr. Brown, one more time, please.